Good evening, everyone. We will make a start. Before we start, I have written on the chat feature already that live captioning is available tonight. There is a link in the chat feature, so please follow the link for the live captioning. Croeso cynnes i bawb i'n digwyddiad heno. Digwyddiad sy wedi drefnu a'i gynnal gan llenyddiaeth Cymru. Digwyddiad drwy gyfrwng y Saesneg fydd hwn, felly dyma droi i'r Saesneg i barhau a'r noson. A warm welcome to you all to our event tonight, organised and hosted by Literature Wales. This event is one of many organised as part of our new Representing Wales programme aimed to develop the craft and careers of writers of colour in Wales. Most of our events are closed events organised for our group of 12 writers only. Since its launch in April, the Representing Wales writers have taken part in a poetry masterclass and have received workshops on the publishing industry. They have been offering critique on each other's work in our monthly writing rooms. They have been paired with a mentor for the year and they have met several published writers and industry experts to discuss their journeys. When we were consulting on the creation of this new programme, we made contact with several sister programmes across the UK who had experience in working with underrepresented writers. One of these programmes were the Ledbury Poetry Critics Programme for Critics of Colour. We were very grateful for the guidance and advice of one of the founders of the Ledbury programme, Professor Sandeep Parmar, who came to be the chair of our application panel for the Representing Wales programme, and we are delighted that she is here tonight. The Ledbury programme wanted to highlight literary communities beyond England, and that is why we are here tonight to give a brief glimpse of some of our literary communities here in Wales. We could organise hundreds of similar events, highlighting the incredible work being done by our grassroots communities across Wales. But we are starting with tonight's brilliant panel, who you will meet very soon. Five individuals who are already working hard to transform the country's literary culture into one that is truly reflective of Wales's diverse communities. Before I hand over to the chair of the panel tonight, Marvin Thompson, I'd like to invite Professor Sandeep Parmar to say a word and Zoe Brigley from Poetry Wales, both of whom are partners on this event tonight. So Sandeep and Zoe, if you could unmute and turn your cameras on. We'd love to hear a, a word from you. A warm welcome to you both here tonight. And I'll pass over to Sandeep, first of all, please. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to be here. Um, and it's going to be such a fantastic event. I can't wait. Um, Yes, so this event is a collaboration between Literature Wales and we're so, so grateful to them for organizing uh, this event with us. Ledbury Poetry Critics was founded in 2017. It was co-founded by myself and by Sarah Howe. Um, and since then we've now accumulated 30 poetry critics, um, all of whom are fantastic poetry reviewers of color. And the poetry critic scheme is primarily a mentorship scheme. And we've worked over the last three years um, or four years now with Poetry Wales um, and with uh, programs and, and uh, magazines across the country. So it's really, really great to be able to think, I think, more, um, more comprehensively about the literature context in Wales specifically today. So very much looking forward to this uh, event. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And I'll pass over to Zoe, if I may. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to be here to represent Poetry Wales as the magazine's interim editor. Poetry Wales is very committed to community building and to supporting producers like those speaking today. Uh, you'll find a write-up about Sadia, who's on the panel today, and an essay on innovative Welsh writers in our summer issue that I edited with the wonderful Vicky Morris. Um, I'm glad to say, too, that Marvin, who is our chair today, 
is a, an editor on our next issue, along with Isabel Barfi, who is a Ledbury poetry critic. And take note because submissions for that uh, for that issue actually close at midnight British time tonight. Uh, you can find out more about us at poetrywales.co.uk. And I just want to finish by saying Diochamvar Ilenidiaith Kemri Literature Wales, and thank you very much to Ledbury poetry critics for all the incredible community building that you do. Hyfryd. Diolch o galon, Zoe. Right, everyone. Marvin, Connor, Sadia, Natalie and Dore, if you could then mute and turn your cameras on. And if you're ready, I will hand over the rest of the evening, Marvin, uh, to your <laughs> capable hands. Over to you. Cheers, Cheers, guys. And what a lovely introduction we've had today so far. Um, I am thrilled and proud to be chairing this discussion about grassroots communities, um, especially since I wasn't born in Wales. I haven't lived in Wales as long as other people. I've only been here for the last 10 to 12 years, I think. So it's nice that I can be part of this growing Welsh community and this growing sense of um, diversity in Wales. So I want to kick it off. I've said too much already. Um, this is all about grassroots literature, communities in Wales. It's about nurturing diversity, but importantly, nurturing excellence. And I think we need to remember that um, in whatever types of literature we are, we're working in, I believe one of the key things we're looking for is to become, you know, super good <laughs> at what we do. So I'm going to start, I'm going to kick off with uh, Sadia, I think. If that's okay, Sadia, if I kick off with you. Right, so welcome. <laughs> welcome one and all. Sadia, tell us, what are your experiences of working with um, within a kind of community of writers, a, lit a literary community? Um, tell us a little bit about the roles you've, you've had and why you felt you needed to um, be part of those communities. Yeah, so um, thank you, Marvin, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so the first um, lit community I kind of joined was actually where I'm coming from, which Duray um, co-founded, um, which was a open mic kind of collective, or still is an open mic collective for underrepresented writers, but everyone's welcome to that. And um, at the same time, I was trying to develop what is now um, Lumen, which is a small press um, a radio show and a curatorial collective, I guess. And kind of based on my experiences of working with or, or being part of a community like the one um, that DeRay helped set up, um, we kind of developed a model of an open collective, which is anyone that we work with, anyone that we collaborate with, is kind of, they get a decision in what how everything is made and whether they want to kind of identify as being part of this wider collective and kind of kind of being aware of people's commitments um, to kind of have to dip in and out of some like creative activity. And yeah, it's it really kind of being in lit communities like that and kind of forming our own has really helped us kind of find a grounding in the Welsh lit, lit scene, which I'm sure it's like this everywhere, but it's quite hard to access when you're kind of considered the underrepresented group. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's kind of how I developed my own community. Okay, and were there any uh, challenges or obstacles when you were developing those uh, organisations? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is probably going to be the same for most people, which is resourcing. Um, when you're trying to think really big and you're trying to care for every kind of writer that you work with or other kind of like collective that you want to collaborate with um you have to kind of find the resources and they're just never adequate enough to provide that care particularly to like underrepresented groups um and another kind of challenge is kind of existing as an integral part of the literary scene in wales um and existing beside really well resourced organizations and those really well resourced organizations that are not capable of working with underrepresented writers in the way you are and having to kind of be in that same sector 
being so under-resourced next to them and just kind of the injustice of that and the really demoralizing kind of sense that that gives you thinking like grassroots organizations aren't choosing to stay grassroots we would like resourcing we would like to support people the way that we kind of know how in a really close intimate way but we just aren't getting the kind of same resources that these safe large organizations are getting but um i guess by having solidarity with other grassroots collectives that has kind of helped overcome the demoralizing aspect and we're kind of getting better at demanding <laughs> what we need. So you're saying that sometimes it can be quite demoralizing seeing the um, inequalities in different organizations, but working with other grassroots organizations can have a sense of um, comradeship. Yeah, exactly. Really, oh, excellent. Right, Jure, can you, um, I, I wanna ask you the same question. Um, what is your experiences of uh, working in, within grassroots literature communities um, and what were your aims when you first started out in these communities? Um, yeah, so my experiences working with grassroots communities while setting up where I'm coming from. Um, we set it up back in 2017. Um, at the time I was quite new to, I think I just, I I'd finished my master's in 2015 and then the two years after I was kind of putting myself out there as a writer, um, as a person of colour in the literary scene in Wales um, and I was attending a lot of open mic nights and I was noticing that I was perhaps one of or if not a couple of the only people of colour in the room um, mm. and that really bothered me because I was kind of like there must be more <laughs> um, so I wanted to set up um, an open mic night monthly open mic night that was a space just for people of colour um, initially that's how we started to just come and kind of share their work um, and also I didn't want to put barriers on kind of access like things like paying to attend or I was noticing that a lot of people that were being platformed had to be published and that I don't think many people realize the extent to which that is a barrier because someone could have a lot of potential but just because they're not published and not being given a platform and then therefore that voice is not being developed or kind of taken further so yeah we wanted to do something that just undid everything that I was seeing <laughs> in the Welsh art scene um, but I forgot the second half of your question sorry uh, I guess the second half of the question was um, and first of all fabulous to hear from you um, what were your aims when you first came out and, and I think you uh, kind of covered that really yeah so the aims was just to have a really safe space where people could share their work create a community um, have access to like networks as well because I was aware that I was part of networks that other people weren't and I just wanted to create a space where there could also be network sharing and collaboration um, between grassroots communities and the more established organizations and bridging that gap. Brilliant so do you think it's important for grassroots communities to work with bigger perhaps public fund publicly funded organizations do you, have you found that helpful or have you found it a hindrance? I think it's important for public funded organisations to work with grassroots communities, <laughs> not the other way around. Um, right. I mean, yeah, public funded organisations do give, you know, they have resources that grassroots communities and upcoming artists can tap into and they're very important. But I also feel like there's just so much to learn on a grassroots level that people overlook a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, I kind of see that it should be a collaboration and also I think the one thing that has been a learning experience for me in setting up where I'm coming from is the level of autonomy. Um, because, yeah, I feel like sometimes when grassroots organisations work with larger organisations, they lose that level of autonomy and that can that can definitely be a hindrance and take away the essence of what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, for me, it's been a learning experience of trying to learn a way to make that compromise and where not to. But, yeah. Brilliant. Right, so we're, we're still doing a round of introductions, really. Uh, I was going to go to Connor next, but Connor, tonight the blokes go last, I'm afraid. <laughs> We're going to go to Natalie. Natalie, um, I know you work more within the publishing industry, um, but I would love to hear your um, experiences of working in grassroots liter literary communities within Wales. I do believe you've got some experience of working in the wider British Isles, uh, particularly in London. So if you could bring that into the answer as well, that'd be wonderful. What are your experiences of working in kind of literary communities within those communities? What have your roles been and what have your aims been? 
Uh, well, um, I probably could be more grassroots because um, as it has transpired over the last 18 months since I became a literary agent, I've discovered I'm the only literary agent um, operating and working in Wales. Um, and I should preface everything that I say by saying that I'm also Welsh, um, so I'm from Newport. Um, I haven't actually left this room in about 18 months, uh, to be honest. I've set myself up here, um, which, you know, has been, yeah, it's been an incredible 18 months bridging, I think, um, as you say, Marvin, the London uh, publishing world. So um, I spent 20 odd years basically working on, on you know, the publishing um, editorial uh, side of things that I worked for three of the big um, publishing houses. So Penguin Random House, it's my first job straight after, um, straight out of university, uh, Macmillan, um, and then Hub Collins. And my last role was at uh, Bonnier. I was there for two years and I, I, I left um, the company and, you know, just had that moment of, okay, what should I do next? And um, thinking, you know, could I possibly have a creative life outside of London? And took a leap of faith and came home and came home to this house that I bought 15 odd years ago, set myself up, created this little office and kind of went from there. And my background um, uh, primarily uh, had been commercial nonfiction, uh, had worked with, you know, all sorts of people, uh, the greater the good uh, across the world of entertainment. And I guess um, for me, coming home and doing this work here, uh, the real kind of drive, I think, um, and certainly where, you know, I see the conversation going, is making, you know, those connections to the London publishing world um, and the bubble, as we call it, uh, you know, that much stronger. And um, I'd like to see more two-way traffic, <laughs> if I'm honest. I was absolutely staggered uh, to find out that I'm the only literary agent operating here. Um, there was a recent profile piece in the bookseller that ran, um, and Literature Wales actually confirmed that. I wasn't aware of it. You know, I set myself up here, completely thinking, well, you know, maybe I could make this work. Um, and wanting to have that flexibility. Um, I just had my daughter as well. And, you know, wanted to be, you know, closer to my family, to my friends and, you know, a community. And I didn't feel that I necessarily had that as a family um, in London. And, you know, I'd spent all those years working, as I say, you know, on the corporate publishing side, thinking and feeling that uh, a creative life in books wasn't possible outside of London. It was just an impossibility. And um, I think that's the, that's the key driver for me now, um, being here. So, um, you know, there, there's some incredible work that's going on, this fantastic talent here. There are a lot of small presses and obviously the Welsh language, um, uh, you know, publishing side of things too. But it still staggers me that and maybe this is because of my background, you know, being uh, uh, um, a corporate beast, if you like, um, that uh, we don't have a HarperCollins in Cardiff. We don't have, you know, a Penguin when there are other, you know, big media um, organisations who have a presence in Wales. And so a lot of the lobbying that I'm doing is about that. And it's not, you know, um, to say uh, it's to the detriment or to push aside the existing work, it's to complement it, it's to bring the scale and the reach that these organisations have, because ultimately, as writers, um, you want your work to be read and to be read by people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that um, I have taken from my publishing background and working with people across the world of entertainment is that sense of being able to reach people around the world <laughs> at any minute, at any given time of the day through social media. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us in Wales, actually, to think about our publishing, not so much locally, but globally. And, um, and as I say, with reach and scale, so it's about taking the talent that exists here and platforming it. And so 
that's a you know essentially that's the work that I'm focusing on um, and trying to do. So as I say, I'd like to see more two-way traffic between uh, Wales and all the work that we're doing here and London. Um, and it's starting to happen. You know, offices are opening um, outside of London by the major houses that just haven't come here yet. <laughs> Which <laughs> we're working fantastic. on. Right, <laughs> like, brilliant. Oh, Natalie. So it was so good to hear um, your experiences of working in that kind of the corporate beast that is London. I used to live there for a good 30 years and how you've transitioned to Wales and set yourself up in Wales. Connor, I want to hear from you now. Um, what are your experiences of uh, working with literary communities in Wales? Um, and within those communities, what was the kind of um, the moment when you thought there's some, there, there needs to be a change, there needs to be something that I can, I can drive and push through? Yo, hey, um, I'm going to flip that then. So I'm going to start with the second question first because it leads more or better in. So during COVID, Literature Wales gave me, so my light bulb moment, Literature Wales gave me a commission, a COVID commission, and I created a uh, interdisciplinary like online installation called 27. And it was like an exploration of kind of my identity and my life um, up to the age of 27, you know, uh, exploring different themes, different processes. And, and it was filled with like poetry, spoken word, letters, essays, um, the whole shebang, you know, um, I wrote a letter to Jamaica, I pictured her as a woman and I wrote a letter to her, like apologizing because I've never stepped foot on it back. You know, I wrote a letter to my younger self. There was poems from where I grew up and I made, I, I partnered this then with, um, artists so i gave like little mini commissions of like only like 25 pound and um i numbered my my work so i wrote and wrote for days and and i had about like six thousand words basically in about 28 pieces and i numbered them and I, I i asked the artist to pick a number between like one and 12 and i gave them random pieces and i said like read my words and create something um on like how it makes you feel so they went away and then they read it and they created all these like images and they yeah some were like just doodles some were um like online digital pieces and others were like videos you know um thank you very much darren and um from that then i obviously posted it um it went live and then what I found, because I, I just thought, oh, it's, you know, it's just me writing some words about, like, mm -hmm. my experience. And then 27 went live and through, because we created, like, a whole website behind this installation, you know, we could look at the analytics. And then we were seeing that, like, people in, like, Canada and France and Norway were, like, reading 27. And I was like, this is mad because, like, Natalie, I'm, I'm, I'm a Newport boy, you know, so I'm just a little kid from a cancer state at Newport and I'm like what there's people in like America they're reading my words this is crazy so I think for me that was the light bulb moment where I was like wow okay so like actually there's something really interesting um about opening up like poetry and words and, and storytelling you know like it, it's it's a way that connects us all I think you know because words are so powerful and when you read someone else's words you feel a, a, a little less alone in the world, you know, you feel heard mm -hmm. sometimes. And that feeling in itself is the most powerful feeling, I think, that you can ever, well, up until this point. Because I haven't had kids, so, you know, like, for me, that feeling in itself so far in my life is, like, one of the most powerful feelings ever. So that's where the light bulb moment was of, like, ah, okay, this is this power in our words so then um later on in the year last year i won a jewel bursary um a jewel live work fund and i wow. used mm -hmm. that money basically to well it was for my development so basically jewel esme fairban and other charitable organizations all banded together to kind of set up um yeah the live work fund which was to sustain 33 artists in britain um so they don't get lost to covid you know mm -hmm. and i was one of the 33 um and part of my and part of the money was for my development so i don't get lost but then i was thinking well i remember watching jada nuka's ted talk uh, at peckham and she she spoke about how like whenever you get a seat at the table pull up a stool so someone else can sit at that table with you and that's always stuck with me you know it's really powerful and i thought well 
why I've got a really cool opportunity here to allow other people to kind of revel in my development. So why not? So I kind of then set up Loyalty, which is a, a black collective of uh, multidisciplinary artists in Wales um, and with the emphasis just being on development. Like there's no end goal. There's no like sharing of like skills to audience members. It's just development. Um, so once a month, we have a masterclass with industry professionals from different mediums to authors, directors, stand-up comedians, producers, the whole kind of shebang and um then they my loyalty members they come along once a month and, and, and we have these these master classes um so they get to develop their own skills and look at themselves as oh. artists you know and and i think for me one thing that 27 really opened up was how i can take my acting and my writing and my poetry and, and merge it all into one um, in a way that I'm an artist, I'm not just an actor or a writer or a poet, like I'm an artist, like I, I use all of those different skill sets to create worlds and create work. And that's what I'm trying to, I guess, bestow upon the loyalty members is like, you're all artists, you're not just one thing. Um, yeah, I feel that's summed that up, I hope. <laughs> You've done really well there, lovely. Connor thought, what struck me was your idea about um, if you've got a seat at the table, pull, pull up a stool. Do you think as a writer of colour, that is particularly important for you to bring along other writers of colour? Or do you think your kind of focus on literary arts is, is not focused on, um, shall we say, racial politics? What's your take on all that? What's, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, does that make nah, sense? No, it makes, it makes sense. It's just, you know, it's... I think every person on this Zoom, you know, can probably attest to how many conversations we all had last year, you know. Um, so I wouldn't, a quote that always stuck with me was, I think it was Malcolm X, when he was like, if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book. And that cut deep, man, growing up, you know. So that's why I'm always like, books are so powerful, whether it's, fiction non-fiction poetry you know words people's stories like it just like i said earlier they're so powerful because they 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 take us outside of our own experience and they allow mm -hmm. us to experience someone else's walk of life and and i always say this is a quote original quote from connor but it's like if you can walk a mile in someone else's shoes you have a bigger capacity for empathy and if we can empathize with someone then we can understand someone and 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 i think words and and literally literacy um they help towards that you know they, they they give us a bigger capacity for empathy so i'm always about developing talent but i think especially in wales talent of color is so underrepresented that even as an uh, like i started as an actor and you know like i just wasn't seeing my experience as a mixed race council estate kid from newport i wasn't seeing my experience represented on stage and then when I look at it deeper, you know, I never really saw my experience represented in books, you know. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. I love Harry Potter. Harry Potter in mixed race, you know. So it's like, even though I loved like Harry Potter books growing up, you know, I never saw myself. And I always remember when they had an open call like for um, when they were making the movies. And I was like, it was that point then when it, when it hit me and I was just like, ah, I can't audition for that because Harry Potter's not me, you know? So it's then about creating the stories where young mixed race kids, young black kids, young black British children and black Welsh children can pick up books and read them and be like, mum, that's me. I can play that or, or this, this story represents me, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, that's why for me it's so important. I'm gonna really? shut this for like I'm talking for ages. Someone no, else lovely. please, you know? Thank you. So you know what? You've led me onto, a, I'm, I'm gonna go slightly off piece a little bit. Um, I've got a controversial point of view here. Please tell me on this. It turns out from national statistics that um, Wales is only 5.2% ethnic minorities, if you want to use that term. Um, it seems to me this 5.2% of the books in Wales are by ethnic minorities, etc. Maybe the representation in Wales is where it should be statistically. Um, I want to say there was advocate, it is Sardia. Challenge me on that, please. 
Five point two percent. That's all we need. If you go into uh, Waterstones in in uh, in Cardiff and you see five point two percent of the books are by Welsh writers of colour, writers of colour, we're good to go. Satisfied. We don't need any of these initiatives, do we? Uh, it's just not representative of the global majority. <laughs> oh, <okay>. uh, <laughs> I mean, questions like that are they are very like devil's advocatey questions because it's it's not like statistics like that aren't representative of the kind of prejudice that exists either. Um, there isn't like 5.2% statistics for like racial hatred. It's like way, way, way more than that. So like, I don't, I think that, I think, and then obviously like the kind of histories of like colonialism in spe specifically Wales, but also Britain as in wider. It's just that we need kind of more global perspectives <laughs> and we need more kind of diverse perspectives to kind of understand like empathy <laughs> I guess I don't know no brilliant thank you um and I'll throw that out to uh Dure as can well I pick up on that sorry oh, Mark. can I pick up oh, on that yeah oh, yeah oh, oh, yeah just to well both or all three of you I guess um so Connor your point about Harry Potter um, one of um, uh, my clients um, is Seleni Henry, and he's writing um, for the first time um, middle grade fiction for kids and couldn't be more excited about this. So, you know, my daughter's book at bedtime, the book's called The Boy With Wings. And one of the things, you know, a lot of the conversations about that happened in this room on a Zoom call uh, with my thinking, you know, can I even work? here you know and so the brilliant thing i think that's happened over the last you know 18 months obviously it's been incredibly traumatic for lots and lots of people but one of the uh, positive things that have come out of you know um, conversations is that um you know the sense that we can work almost anywhere and you know we can almost kind of you know reach each other and be connected with one another you know that much faster and more easily and this point about empathy I think is an incredibly important one and what books can do what books can do over and above and I you know probably say this to my dying breath over and above you know film or tv or any other form of media because books there's a permanence to books there's a permanence to the written word you know you um, are immersed in a world in someone else's imagination and it can take you places and, you know, the skills that you get from reading as opposed to passively watching, <laughs> you know, whether it's a video game or film or TV or whatever, um, those skills, those life skills that you get from, from books and from reading are in absolutely invaluable. And a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment, I'm hoping within the industry and, you know, the same grassroots is about building that sense of empathy and understanding between you know each other because we need it the last 18 months have been such you know a shock i think on the on uh, the race front that you know we're having conversations that we've just not had in this country before certainly not in my lifetime or any of our lifetimes so whether you know it's black lives matter then the Meghan markle interview and then even just last week and what it's really thrown up is this sense of, do we even know who we are as Britons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Brilliant. and yeah, I think being here, being black um, or, you know, mixed background or any, you know, non-white um, background, we really do have a lot of work uh, to do uh, in order for our voices to be heard, to be seen, to be recognized. Uh, for people to understand who we are, that we even live here. I mean, I think, you know, what happened last week, massively, hugely triggering and traumatic on, you know, the point of uh, this sense of once again, you know, do I belong here? One of my, again, another client, David Harewood's book. Um, so David Harewood, the actor, um, had a psychotic breakdown when he was 23. And again, is one of the... Um, uh, first deals that I did, you know, when I set myself up as an agent and his book is called Maybe I Don't Belong Here. And I can't quite believe that we're 
still in this position. So, you know, when I was growing up in Newport in the 80s, you know, there was National Front around, there was, you know, the graffiti and all the rest of it. And as a little black girl, it's horrible growing up in that atmosphere, you know, that sense of anything could kick off at any time, you know. Yeah, and then, I, you know, I, fast forward yeah. a couple of years, you see what happens with Stephen. Yeah, with Stephen Lawrence. And then seeing what happened last week, that, you know, it's, it's, it's like a cauldron, you know, it's all kind of bubbling under the surface. And that's what I think we all have to do, regardless of your race. We all have to put our backs into this work to figure out a way that we're going to live <laughs> together. Live together. And, you know, side by side, you know, yeah, you know, lovely, happily. Lovely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. yeah, thank you, Natalie. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, so I agree. I mean, I agree that actually last week I'm getting to talk about the the football when free black players or black or Jew heritage players missed the penalty. I mean, come on, guys. That's what that's what England is is, is kind of known for. This is what Absolutely. we do. <laughs> we we miss penalties. We cry a bit. We get on. We don't need the racism. However, I want to ask uh, Jure in terms of other countries. What do you think um, grassroots communities, literature communities in Wales could learn from other countries? Um, I kind of like Sadia might be a better, considering she's recently done an international residency, so she might be a better person for that um, question. Um, I've had very little, kind of only recently have I started to do international collaborations and that's more individually mm -hmm. as an artist. Um, rather than from my where I'm coming from hat on um, and I think what strikes me is yeah I think what you were mentioning earlier about the level of development um, that happens and also um, mm -hmm. the level of grassroots communities that do exist as well I think sometimes um, we fall into this mindset and maybe it's changing over time but like you can there's only sometimes space for one um, and I think that speaks right. to perhaps the wider industry and how the industry functions is like we're as people of color we're often pitted against each other um, by you know how the how everything works and like there's only a certain amount of space and internationally I feel like that's perhaps not the case but again I feel like that's quite a broad brush that I'm tarring like international collectives with um, but I wanted to kind of go back to what you said about um, the five percent representation. Go for it. <laughs> um, so if I heard right, did you say that there's people of ethnic minority low to use in them? Wales? In Wales, they're only about five percent. Five point two percent. That's what that's what Google said. It might be five point four now. You know. <laughs> and uh, did you say the amount of books written by? I guess what I'm. I guess one argument would be if you want true representation of a country in terms of literature. You could literally do it on a mathematical basis. Ninety-five percent Welsh white, five percent Welsh not white. If you like, that's not how I suppose I would do it. But that's a that's a challenging question. I'm here to challenge you. <laughs> yeah, and I think well, I wanted to go back to that because I think that calls to question of looking beyond statistics. And actually, I've kind of written about that in Darren is here, so he's um, he's editing a book at the moment called Welsh Plural um, about you know what it means to be Welsh and new ways of looking at Welsh and I think we just really need to move beyond statistics I mean statistics are uh -huh. important um, but I think even when it comes to like how we define our identities we're always like talking about it in statistics and then we go ahead and, and apply the same statistics to like other things like yeah we can say five percent representation is enough to reflect the five percent population but then if that five percent population is not seeing themselves in that five percent representation that statistics becomes quite mute so Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also that's again to say that stories by people of colour are not universal. Um, so it's like if you only have 5%, sorry, I feel like I'm having a go at you, but I'm not. <laughs> but, go, have um, a go at me, have a go at me. <laughs> but it's like, so if you have only 5% writers of colour published, you're kind of saying, well, they're, they're enough for that 5%. But it's like, why can you not say that writers of colour can be represented in the 90% and... 100% of the population will relate to them. I think it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot more nuance to it than that. So. I would agree. I mean, my take on it, now that you've had a go at me, thank you. <laughs> um, my take on it is this, is if Wales must have a, a really enriched literary culture 
and wants to create young people and people in general who are more empathetic, we need more than 5%. Because for decades, it was one or 2% or even 0% that you were getting in terms of black literature or literature of colour, shall we call it that, or even LGBTQ plus literature or disabled literature. All these different marginalised minorities, uh, marginalised uh, communities, shall we say, who are using grassroots communities to give themselves a platform. These are the kind of communities that can really enrich and enliven the Welsh literature culture. To me personally, if you had 20 or 30% of marginalised voices creating books and distributing their stories throughout Wales, Wales as a nation will become much more enlivened, emboldened, much more of a rich literary heritage would grow from that, I do believe. That's my take on that. But I want to now focus hate... on... Sorry, sorry, Marvin, Margaret. just on that quickly. I, I absolutely, I hate these statistics because they're so misrepresentative of the population size of the country. We're talking 60 odd million people here. So when, you know, numbers like 3%, you know, black mm. and so on are bandied around, well, 3% of 60 odd million people, 65 million people is a lot of people. And yet, you know, The Guardian, for example, um, it was a few years ago, their research, the top 500 books, published in the UK, you know, six of them are, are written by black British authors. So it's not like for like, it's not apples and oranges. And, you know, to come back to the point about social media, we're living in a, a you know, we have a global economy. Mm -hmm. We're connected to everyone, everywhere. So this sense of, you know, um, local and local thinking, mm -hmm. I, I just think it's, it's we're not, we're not fit for purpose in terms of, you know, where, we are in the world and our place and sense of the world. And I think of, you know, um, my daughter and she's six and what she's consuming on YouTube and Netflix and everything else, you know, she's certainly not thinking, you know, I'm in Wales <laughs> and only <laughs> Wales and I should only be reading Welsh authors. Do you know what I mean? And I'm yeah, a little black I, girl here. Yeah. That's not, she's not, they're not the kid, they're not thinking that way at all. You know, I the biggest yeah. study, um, most popular band at the moment is um, is BTS and they, they sing in Korean. So do you know what I mean? I think it's a bit mm -hmm. of a misnomer and I, I would urge us to not go down that route. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would agree with you there. And I would, and I would also, I'd also want to now flip, flip the conversation to the future. What can grassroots um, organisations do to help our, the future literary scene of Wales be more diverse, be more inclusive, I'm going to start with Sadia, I think, and we're going to flip to Connor after that. How can grassroots organisations and communities help to develop the um, inclusiveness of uh, Welsh culture as we move forward? Well, I think that grassroots organisations are always going to be doing really cool, radical, inclusive things from like workshops to providing spaces to kind of alternative like pedagogy models to like, I don't know, alternative ways of being published like in like on the radio, for example. Um, they're always gonna be doing that because there's always gonna be some like cool, diverse young people trying to do something <laughs> for, you know, for ourselves to, to kind of be in the lit scene in our, on our own terms. And actually the thing that grassroots organizations could do and basically are already doing for future generations is making demands of the sector to look like how it should look, to be more equitable, how it should be, to kind of kind of divest and devolve resources and power as it should already be doing. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's a lot to ask grassroots organizations who are under-resourced to do something for future <laughs> generations, but we are anyway. We're it's doing like you. yeah, but we're doing more than institutions, in my opinion. And actually, institutions really kind of follow on and sometimes co-opt the work of grassroots organizations mm. so it's the only thing that we in my opinion the only thing that we need to do is to kind of keep them in check and hold them to account for how they're using their resources to kind of build the kind of equitable lit scene that the future generation deserve, deserves basically oh thank you so great 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 insights there I, I like the idea that you kind of hit the nail on the head there in terms of you we shouldn't put, put the pressure on grassroots organizations to fix the future. That's not your job. Your job is just to, in my 
um, in, in my thinking, is to see what's good for you, see what works for you as individuals and as collectives and work on that and see where that goes. Connor, I want to hear from you. Um, how do you think your collective could uh, be uh, issuing a new future for Wales in terms of a more diverse Wales? Uh, <clears throat> wow. Um, Big question. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I, I always think it's cyclical, like, you know, it comes in cycles. So for me, it's like I've got, like, knowledge is power, right? So if I can, like, I've already learned some stuff from hearing, like, everyone in this Zoom talk, which I'm then going to go and bestow that to other people. So when I'm having conversations with friends, I'll be like, oh, well, you heard this the other day, actually. Let me think about this. Or actually, like, there's so-and-so, you should check them, you know? So it's like, we should always share knowledge. Um, a, a mentor of mine, Brian Kimmins, so always says, art is open source. And I and, and I truly believe that, you know, in the same way that, you know, lit literacy and, and theater art everything is all open source so like we should all be sharing and that's why a lot of people when i then set up loyalty were like what what like why would you do that and that it just didn't make no sense to me i was like but why wouldn't i like i don't understand why if you've got something like you've got knowledge why you want to hold it all to yourself and just have all the power it just makes no sense you know share that because then other people can can benefit from that so if we all walk around with metaphorical ladders you know that means that I can hold a ladder down and allow other people to climb up and be on the same oh. level as me. But then I can also put that ladder up and climb up to be on the same level as all the people that I aspire to be like, you know? So I think we should all walk around with metaphorical ladders and, and just help others, but also climb ourselves. That for me is, is, is what I try and instill in the loyalty members that, you know, it's, is cyclical so they'll have that and then they'll pass that down to the next wave or pass that down to the next wave you know so when i look at, at wales as an industry we're not going in my opinion we're not going to change probably in my lifetime you know like but what it means i think for all us here we can build solid equitable foundations for the next generation to build upon and build upon and build upon so therefore like in three or four generations of welsh artists they then won't feel like a minority they'll feel equal and they'll feel equitable and they'll feel like actually i deserve to be at this table so i i think because we live in a quick consumption world you know like you can binge watch a whole series on netflix in a day you can order stuff from amazon prime and it's delivered by the time you get home from work you can jump on uber eats and get food to your door in 15 minutes like everything's quick and people always think oh well you know this institutional like racism within the arts and within literacy in Wales is going to just go away if we just chuck some money at it or if we just like if we just invest in this and it's like no it doesn't work like that there's a reason why all these grassroots organizations are thriving because we've taken our time we're not the first to do it but we're doing it right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. always strive don't strive to be first, strive to get it right. Because if you get it right, you leave a lasting legacy. And then it's it's justified for, I think, you know, like time further on, like for years later, it'll always be remembered instead of being, oh, well, the first people to do that. Which is, yeah, it's great that I'm old in time, but it's not exactly great then if like, you know, the the grassroots organization has folded two years down the line. Whereas if you take your time, you get it right you can sustain it's like sustainability so i think that it's a really long-winded answer so i apologize but yeah i think if we sustain our kind of grassroots thinking and partner that with the big organizations because i agree with sadi you know like it shouldn't be down to us because you've got like public funded organizations out there which i'm really blessed with loyalty that you know i've had so much support from public funded organizations um which has helped this first year of loyalty's iteration, you know, be thriving and bumping. But it, I think collaboration and sustainability are the two keys. If, if we can collaborate, but I don't think it should be us as grassroots always going to, you know, the big organizations, please help us. Why aren't they coming to us and being like, actually, you guys are doing it right. How can we help you? And I think it's that change, that shift of power then, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's not to like, you know, badmouth any of the organizations that help me because they're amazing, you know, but I've, I've made it very abundantly clear. I was like, cool, like, this is m like mine and 
you guys are there and, and if I need you, I will come to you. But like, I've got it. And, and, and that's been amazing. They've given me that breathing space, but I know that they're there. So if, if I do need them, I can, I can drop them in an email or I can chat and it's fine, you know? But I think that it's that shift of power that I think then is that, that little tweak in, in the whole bubble of Wales. And then it's like, ah, now actually, we're not being seen as the grassroots and lesser than these big organizations. We're all on a level playing field. And I think once that happens, then yeah, justified really? change will happen. I love I love the idea, Connor, of having metaphorical ladders that people can climb up, you can help them climb up, you can climb up yourself to reach other people. I love the idea of that sense of community of raising each other up. Um I've really enjoyed this conversation. I want to go on for another hour and a half, but I know we can't all do that. <laughs> so have you got any questions from the audience? There or, is a question in the q There is a question. There is a question, isn't there? Thank you, Connor. It says, here's the question, what role did or do libraries play in our journeys? What can they do better to build communities? Uh, let's start with um, Jure. Do you want to take that one up? Um, yeah, um, I think libraries can play a huge role. Um, there's so much, I think, well, I mean, I'm thinking back pre-COVID times, but physical reading groups, even simple things as facilitating and offering space. Um, when Where I'm Coming From started, we actually struggled to find space. Um, I think even now libraries often charge for space, <laughs> oh. um, which is baffling to me because libraries should be, you know, they're for everyone to access. Um, growing up, like I spend the majority of my childhood in a library, um, and <laughs> you know, like I think, which is which can be the same that can be said for everyone here. Um, but I think libraries are kind of like no different to any other organization. Um, I mean, they are different in any other ways, but I think they it's just about collaboration, offering space, creating initiatives with grassroots communities, and be like, well, what ideas do you have? How can we support? How can we provide free books to the communities or how can we kind of help you kind of get set up or things like that um yeah i think i think it's the little things that everyone can do that makes grassroots communities lives easier because like everyone keeps saying here we are so under resourced um especially where i'm coming from like we've what Connor was saying earlier about sustainability i feel like after running so successfully for three years we've we did kind of hit a bit of that wall where we were like well to kind of to keep on doing the work that we need to do we need more resources and if people kind of step in and be like well here's some resources to help you do what you do instead of kind of being stuck in this bureaucratic systems of doing things where you must do one thing before you can do the next thing and then you must be able to do that thing to do like it's just it's so much gatekeeping um so yeah but i mean i do want to give shout out to cardiff libraries and gordon i'm not sure if he's here but he he facilitated where i'm coming from one of their events um, at Cardiff Central Library that platformed a lot of writers that have then gone on to do more things. Um, so, yeah, I think it's the same. Oh, thank you, Jure. Excellent. Now, we're, we're coming towards the end of our glorious, enriching, enlivening discussion. So I want to get some closing, short closing statements from each of you um, about um, literary com communities, grassroots activism, where you see it heading, how it in, in um, emboldens you as a writer. Let's start with uh, Sadia. Um, I suppose in the future, what I'd like to see is a kind of complete switch of power and hierarchy from the institutions and the grassroots communities where it's no longer them, the institutions trying to like, kind of pay grassroots communities like basically pennies to engage audiences on behalf of them and actually we have the funding we have autonomy of funding and the distribution of funding and resources and we directly kind of engage the audiences that we can safely and caringly do so um, I'd also like to see kind of 10 new publishing houses in Wales and at least one of them to be led or at least have one person of colour who works there but led, mostly led, because right now I don't think um, it's really viable for people of colour to be published in Wales without coming across some sort of harm. Um, was that the question about like the future? <laughs> it was a closing statement and you give me a wonderful closing statement, Sadia. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Natalie, any closing statements from you? Yeah, I mean, I think just picking up on what uh, Sadia just said, it's the, the switch in hierarchy. It's, it's popping that for me, it's popping the London bubble. Uh, you know, if the BBC are here and ITV are here and various other people, then Harper Collins should be here and Penguin should be here. And, you know, the talent is here. So it's ensuring that that pipeline, um, you know, of brilliant writers and creatives is met and it's met substantially with, with scale and reach. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my thought on it. And also absolutely that we do need, and I've been talking about this for forever in a day, more black editors, please, more black publicists, more non-white, uh, you know, marketing people and sales people and e at every part, retailers as well, booksellers at every part of the chain. Um, we need all of it and we need it quite quickly. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Lovely. Lovely getting that in that in that in depth industry perspective. Thank you, Natalie. Connor, um, any closing statement? I mean, if we're doing shade day, took I'll give a shade to Gavin Porter because he was the one that told me about that uh, ladder metaphor. You know, so I can't exactly take full credit for that one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, closing statement. I'd probably say you know take. I hate I hate using the term take risks because I don't ever see myself as a risk. You know, but. I just see myself as as talent, you know, and you're investing in, in, in my talent and you're investing in me. But I understand how a lot of people are like, oh, he hasn't really got that many years experience. Oh, it could be, it can be considered a risk. Oh, they don't know how to manage budgets that well. Oh, we can't give them this much. You see, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see the nods. But that's what I mean, see. So it's like take risks, you know, because, um, yeah, okay, like I might fail. But I'm going to learn from that failure and come back better. But if I'm not given the opportunity, okay, if you don't take the risk and give me that opportunity, then how am I ever going to get the experience? But also how am I ever going to learn that lesson? So I think, you know, take risks and yeah, give opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you, Connor. Risk and opportunities. I like that. And um, Dure, to, to, to be the closing person, please, what would you like to say? I Leave really, us with something insightful. <laughs> I really do just want to echo what Sadia said about complete switch of power. I think that's what's important. And I also think, uh, I mean, this is again two jargon words that people throw out right now, but it's this whole idea of diversity versus decolonization. And I think uh, I've been involved in my Twitter debates on decolonization and it's like this whole complete shift of mindset. Like I feel like moving forward so people want change but people want change in a way that makes them comfortable and mm -hmm. it's like sometimes change needs to be uncomfortable and uncomfortable doesn't necessarily mean bad it just means you're you know you're questioning your privilege you're questioning things you've taken for granted to make space for more and it's like making space for more doesn't compromise your space and i think a lot mm -hmm. of people just really struggle to understand that so everyone just wants to sprinkle diversity in and call it a day but it needs to go deeper than that so it needs to go deeper than that. Thank you very much, Jure. Now I'm going to pass back to Literature Wales, who are going to close the show. Thank you so much, Marvin, for smoothly steering such an interesting discussion tonight. And to the four panellists, Dure, Connor, Natalie and Sadia for sharing your experiences and insights. Uh, you've given a lot uh, for us to think about in the, the industry, the literature and publishing industry. And I know many of my colleagues are, are listening in and um, we will be uh, discussing tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Um, before we leave, can I thank you, uh, give my thanks rather to our partners again. So the Ledbury Poetry Critics Programme and Poetry Wales and to Marina, the live captioner as well. Uh, and to our funders, the Arts Council of Wales for your support. Thank you everyone in the audience as well. Um, there are lovely comments in the chat. I'll be sure to save those and I will be sharing a recording of this uh, discussion with everyone who booked to come here tonight as well. Um, so do visit literaturewales.org for more information about our organisation and we hope to see you all very soon. Have a nice evening everyone. <laughs>